When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. What policies the government imposes, what the Fed does. Right now, we all know that the Fed is raising interest rates. That has as much of an effect on people as their ability to save money. In fact, it greatly affects their ability to save money. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Remember that economics course you took? Yeah, me neither. But it turns out that knowing what's happening in the economy is more important than you know, because politicians are making decisions with the economy that have a direct impact on your money. So as our guest, Howard Yaris, economist, professor at NYU, and author of the new book, Understandable Economics, because understanding our economy is easier than you think and more important than you know, says it is time that you start paying attention to our economy and the people that are making the decisions. The thought that in the economists or the politicians or whomever has their best interests at heart, uh, it's, it's just, I don't think that it warrants that kind of confidence. I think people need to serve as a check on the decisions these people are making. You know all those companies laying off workers right now? Well, that's because of the economy. And the reason behind your $100 grocery shopping bill that was 50 bucks last year, well, that is also because of the economy. So in this episode, Howard's spilling the beans on everything you need to know about economics, our economy, where money comes from, and how our current economy directly impacts your money. So if you snoozed through that econ class like I did, this episode is your crash course in everything you need to know. Let's start talking. Real quick before we jump in the conversation, I just want to talk to you about the sponsors of this podcast. You know, it's my job to bring you only the best companies and products that I believe will help you live a better life, save some time and money, and help you build and protect your cash. So to do that, I personally vet every single sponsor to make sure they are Shauna approved. These sponsors help keep this show free to you and allow us to bring on some amazing guests to help you on your money journey. So here's where you come in. I need you to do me a favor and like and support the sponsors on this show that you love so we can keep this podcast growing for years. You can find all the links in the show notes to all our sponsors, along with a special code for all of our ETM discounts and deals. Thanks so much, my friend. Into the episode we go. You wrote this great new book called Understandable Economics, because understanding our economy is easier than you think and more important than you know. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we talk about money, obviously, on this show a lot, but there's a lot of us, I would say the majority of us have no idea how the economy actually works, let alone uh, how it actually impacts, you know, our money and our ability to grow and save our money. So I can't wait to to kind of break this all down in terms that everybody's going to understand. So let's start here. You know, 
why is understanding how our economy works more important than we know? Like, what are we missing? Great question. I have listened to a bunch of your podcasts and people are rightfully and understandably concerned about their personal finances. But the big picture also affects them enormously. What policies the government imposes, what the Fed does. Right now, we all know that the Fed is raising interest rates. That has as much of an effect on people as their ability to save money. In fact, it greatly affects their ability to save money. So it's, Im- it's important for them to know what's going on in the, in the macro economy and the larger economy. But why is it important? And the answer is because people, politicians, economists are making decisions that greatly affect their economic well-being, your listeners' well-being. They may try to save, they may work harder, they may take a second job, but what the government does also has an enormous effect on their well-being. So they should, one, understand what the government's doing, and two, support politicians and policies that are going to make their lives better. They just can't sit back, in my opinion, and let politicians or economists make make these decisions without their input, because they may not be making the decisions that your listeners would want them to make. I think that's a great point because it's it's easy to think that whatever happens in the economy is just so out of our control that there isn't anything that we can possibly do about it. So I love the um the, the sort of charge that you know we need to become a- active, we need to mm-hmm. uh, you know put our vote behind people who stand for what we believe in and understand then how that has a, you know a direct impact on our money. Mm -hmm. It's not only I find it interesting, maybe other people may not. But the point is, I, I feel they have to be interested because it so significantly affects their lives. It's as significant as how much they save, how hard they work and what they're doing for a living, whether the economy goes up or goes down, it affects them and they should have a say. And the thought that in the economists or the politicians or whomever has their best interests at heart <laughs> It's it's just, I don't think that it warrants that kind of confidence. I think people need to serve as a check on the decisions these people are making. I like that message. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, I want to get back to talking about the Fed in just a minute. But before we get there, there's something I really want to to talk about. I think everyone listening would be really interested in this. I really want to know, you know, where does money actually come from? How does it gain value? And who in the world actually controls money? That's a, r- a really good question. And the most fascinating thing I could say at the outset regarding that is they pulled economics students and the majority didn't know where money comes from. <laughs> so here's the short answer. I talk about this in Understandable Economics. There are three parts to the history of money. One, we all know gold and silver. We all, we're all familiar with the Bible. In the Middle Ages, that went out for paper currency backed by primarily by gold. And it literally in the 20th century, which is really recent in the history of of human beings, the backing ended. It's just paper. The paper comes from the government, specifically the Federal Reserve. They create the money. They create it totally out of thin air. There's (laughs) nothing backing it. There's just the credibility of the United States government behind it. It's, It's just paper. And the point I make in the book is you can get all, I think we're up to 8 billion people on the planet to, to agree that a $20 bill is more desirable to them than a $1 bill, whereas you couldn't get all of them to agree on the location of the Empire State Building or that the sky is blue. There are going to be a few holdouts. But when it comes to the $20 bill versus the $1 bill, I would bet there are no holdouts. I bet every single one. So it's just created out of thin air. And I think it's kind of remarkable because the Empire State Building, you can, or the, even the that the earth is round. You can observe it, and yet there are still a few holdouts. When it comes to money, it's just the printer happened to put a 20 on rather than a 1, and boom, everyone believes it. So yes, the money all comes from the government in its physical form, the currency, and electronic form, the money in our uh, checking accounts. So, I mean, I as many times as I hear this story, it still just, it just makes me, it's like a head scratcher that... Um, you know, we we basically put the put the value on these dollar bills, like you were just saying. But how then do we how how then do we trust money? 
It works. That's the, it. People, how do we trust Bitcoin? That's that's a loaded question. <laughs> that the people who create our money are employed by us. We know the rules they operate operate under. These the people who run the Fed are are highly reputable people who have transparency. They've been doing this for over a century. And so we trust what they're doing and it works. So it's a system that works. When it comes to Bitcoin, they don't even know who founded Bitcoin. Some guy who was supposedly living in his mother's basement or something. I, I don't know what the story is, but no one does is my point. And, and yet a lot of people, there's a valuation. I haven't checked it this morning, but it's, it's like $20,000 each. So people... As much as we hear about lack of trust these days, people are willing to trust quite a bit. And, and I think the U.S. dollar has, has earned the trust and place it has in our economy. It's, it's all based on trust. And again, it works. One little footnote, uh, to pay your taxes, uh, you have to pay it in U.S. dollars. That's one like bit of, of objective reality regarding the money, because if you don't pay your taxes, theoretically, you could go to jail. So that's one objective role for the US dollar. It's not totally based on faith. It's based on a desire not to go to prison. So that has that's one advantage the US dollar has and will always have over Bitcoin. Uh, I don't see the US uh. Treasury accepting Bitcoin any anytime soon. So it's it just makes life so much easier to have a currency we all rely on. As we discussed, everyone seems to, to and literally everyone seems to rely on it. Uh, the fact that you have to pay your taxes in dollars gives it a, even more credibility. And the bottom line is, I said it before, it works. It's so interesting to me. Um, mm. You know, I, obviously, I didn't think about it from that perspective. But yeah, none of us want to go to prison, so right. <laughs> we're we're more than happy to to pay our pay our dues. Another mm-hmm. thing I want to talk about is is in your book you. Uh, share some kind of stark realities. You say that you know incomes are staggering, middle class jobs are disappearing, economic growth is slowing, and you know the meager gains that are they're being made they're they're only going to the wealthy. So, talk to us a little bit about this idea of like economic inequality, and we know that it's it's getting wider and wider. But is there is there anything that can be done about it? Well. Let's first talk about why it's happening. The the you, you mentioned the first part of the subtitle of the book. It's 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 uh, more more important more important than you know. Uh, it's understandable economics because the economy is more important than you know, and it's easier to understand and more important than you know. In any event, the point about the economic inequality is that it's growing, and why is it growing? Let's. I have an example in the book. That explains it. A hundred years ago, there were no records or no CDs. There was no Spotify. If you wanted to hear live music, you had to go to a music hall. You had to go to a theater. Every city of any size had at least one theater. New York, there were dozens, if not hundreds of theaters. Now you just flip on your computer and you hear great music from one or, or a few superstars and you could hear it over and over and over again. So all the jobs related to all those music halls are gone. Not only are the performers' jobs gone, but the ushers' jobs are gone. The people who maintain the music halls, all those jobs are gone. And the international superstars are doing better than any one singer could have ever done. Even if they were the best singer in New York City, there's only so much they could have earned by selling up that one house each night. So that's true not only of performances, it's it's true of, of almost everything. If you wanted to sell sweaters in New York in, in the 1950s and also set up another place to sell sweaters in San Francisco, it would be really complicated. You'd have these expensive long distance phone calls. You'd have all this complication. Now, Jeff Bezos just uses the cost-free platform <laughs> of the internet to sell sweaters and everything you can imagine, everything under the sun throughout the world. And it's it's there are no transaction costs. It's not like someone in New York in 1950 trying to sell sweaters in San Francisco um, with all the expenses and complication that involved. So what's happened is the we have economies of scale. I think that's what a business person or economist would call it. Like we've never had before. It's never been cheap and easy for someone sitting in their apartment in Manhattan to sell stuff 
to someone sitting in Shanghai or Jakarta or anywhere. Before the internet, that would have been not only terribly expensive, but probably impossible. And now it's cost-free. So it enables the people who are best. Jeff Bezos is obviously, he knows what he's doing, but it allows him to monopolize industries. And so when people monopolize industries, they get much bigger and much richer and everyone else is denied or has limited opportunity. What do you think can be done to you know, um, even out the inequality, or is this is this just the way it goes? No, <laughs> our economy is is a choice. How we and that's goes back to what we were discussing earlier that people need to know what's going on and support the policies that are going to promote their interests. They just can't rely on whoever happens to be in Congress to be looking out for their best interests. So. What can we do? I'll tell you one thing just off the top of my head. There is a special lower tax rate for people who work for hedge funds and private equity funds. It's called the carried interest loophole, for, for, for lack of a better word. It results in a lower tax rate for those people. Those people who can earn literally billions of dollars a year are paying a lower tax rate than the average policeman and average teacher. That's just wrong. And I think I don't think there's any justification for it. I think what's happened is people are just not aware of it. So they're, they're, they're just, they're just going along with it because they don't speak up. People need, need to know that as Warren Buffett, who has a fortune of about $80 billion once (laughs) pointed out, he has, you may know this, he had, he pays a lower tax rate than his secretary because he earns his income through investments and she earns it through work. Why are we taxing work at a higher rate than we do investments? That's the, there isn't much justification for that, other than the fact that people are not paying enough attention to this and asserting their interests, asserting their views that this shouldn't be the case. That is just mind blowing to me mm-hmm. that um, that happens, and, and I know this is what infuriates people and. I think, again, it comes back to this idea of, you know, what could I as just a single human being actually do to affect change? But if we all stay in that place, nothing is actually going to change. So, you know, I think we need, you know, the first step, I think, is really understanding how these things work, which is why we have somebody amazing like you on the show to to break down some of these concepts for us. Another thing that, you know, I'm I'm just curious about because this has come up a lot lately. I've heard a lot about this is the uh, the national debt ceiling and hitting that ceiling. And I, I think it's easy to just kind of zone out because like we hear these headlines and we hear them kind of over and over again. And they just seem to kind of appear and it's apparently like a really big deal. And then it just kind of disappears. And so To me, it's like, well, you know, why bother even paying attention to this if it's just going to kind of come and go? Fill us in a little bit about, you know, the national debt ceiling. And, you know, is it this big deal that we were apparently hitting the debt ceiling? um, Or is this just something that kind of happens over and over again in our economy? I think you hit the nail on the head. It comes and goes. The risk is this time it comes but doesn't go. The issue is we have a debt ceiling in law of $31.4 trillion. Now that sounds like a crazy amount of money. In Understandable Economics, I talk about this congressperson mixing up a million and a billion. The point is these numbers are so big, I can't get my head around them. And I think most people who are honest will admit they can't get their their heads around them. So what I do in the book is, is figure out what is the debt per person? What is the 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 app that if you divided the total debt by the number of people in America, what does it come out to? And it comes out to about $68,000 per American. That's a number we could all get our heads around. Now, you could say $68,000 of debt per person is too much. You could say it's not a, a problem. But the point, objectively, I'll say two things. One, it's not a bankruptcy inducing existential threat the way a lot of politicians make it out to be. $68,000 per person is a lot of money, but it's Given the strength of the American economy, it's just not a nation-ending kind of issue. And so the question is, is it, 
is it reasonable? Well, speak to anyone who ever who went to medical school or started a business or bought a home. Six to eight thousand dollars of debt, they probably have have had greater debt. There are a lot of students who have greater debt. So is it too much? I think it comes down to what was that debt incurred for? If it was incurred to educate kids, to build roads, to make our economy more efficient, yeah, it makes sense. That's why people borrow money to go to medical school, to start businesses. If it was incurred to just push the tax burden down the road, no. It's, it's like someone taking out a, a loan to go on a particularly extravagant vacation. That doesn't make sense. So it comes down to, is the spending useful? Is it creating a, a better and more productive society? And so that's really the issue, not the, the number. The number, again, $31.4 trillion doesn't mean much to me. It probably doesn't mean much to anyone. Six to eight thousand dollars does mean something, and the question is, are we getting value for our money? And that's that's really the issue. Is Congress spending our money in a way that's going to make our country safer, better, more productive, happier, et cetera, et cetera? That's the and, real question. Yeah what what causes it to to keep in, increasing? So like oh. we, we keep coming up against these. You know, where we're at this like nail biting moment where you know if something doesn't happen, you know who knows what's going to happen. Oh, in all fairness, I got carried away with the debt. I didn't answer your question about the debt ceiling. Okay, let's get to the debt ceiling now. So Congress every year spends X number of dollars. There's only two ways they could get money, two and only two ways, taxing, borrowing. If they don't tax it, they have to borrow it. Literally every dollar Congress spends, there's no wiggle room there, has to be taxed or borrowed. So every year they tax less than they spend. How much this year they taxed about a billion dollars? Uh, sorry, there I got mixed up again. <laughs> it's a trillion dollars less than they spent. So they have to borrow a trillion dollars. The cumulative debt is limited to $31.4 trillion. So they need to borrow more money to cover the expenses they already incurred. In other words, you have a credit card, you run up a debt, and you, you, need to, you need to pay off the debt. What the Congress is saying is similar to what, what someone who ran up a credit card debt, it would be similar to them saying, well, my debt's too high now. I don't feel like paying it. That's just not acceptable. You ran up the debt, you got to pay the, the expenses. And I think it's very irresponsible. And what are the consequences if they finally say, uh-uh, the U.S. government has to default. It's not going to have enough money to pay its obligations. It's going to tank the world economy if, if the U.S. government is suddenly viewed as a deadbeat. Uh, I don't know what would happen to, for instance, if you have a money market fund, that money is invested in treasury securities, U.S. government debt. If that goes away, what happens to the money in your money market fund? It could... I don't, again, we don't have answers to this because it's never happened before. But the point is, it's bad. It's really bad for the U.S. economy. If people's savings start disappearing, they're going to stop spending and the economy theoretically could go into a total tailspin. It's, but the point that I want to make, it's a totally self-inflicted wound. The, they can borrow the money. The investors are, are there read, perfectly ready and willing to buy U.S. government debt. It's just they may just decide uh, the people in Congress and their limited wisdom to say, <laughs> forget it. We're, we're not going to borrow the money and let the government bounce checks and we'll see what happens. And that would be, in my opinion, a really bad thing. Yeah, I think that would be that would be a bad day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Think about your own personal finances. If you decided, hey, my debt's too high, I don't feel like paying it, there are consequences to that. And there are going to be consequences if the U.S. government does that as well. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. 
but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. So let's get back and talk about the Fed a little bit, because we know that they've been increasing interest rates, and that's been impacting things like our mortgage payments, if we if we buy a new house, car payments, even credit card interest rates. But there's still this big confusion about what the Fed actually does. So what what is their job? Okay, l- let's think about the problem, and then we'll think about the, how, what the Fed does in response to it. The problem, inflation. Prices are going up. What causes prices to go up? I've heard it explained so many times. And the simplest way, I think, to understand it is if spending increases more than the amount of stuff, prices are going to get bid up. Economists like to say it's too many dollars chasing too few goods. If there's more money floating around, if the amount of money floating around is is grows more than the amount of stuff, you're going to get higher prices. If the amount of money or spending grows more slowly than the amount of stuff, you get deflation. And if the amount of money and spending grows at the same rate as the amount of stuff, and when I say stuff, I mean goods and services, you get stable prices. So there have been a variety of reasons why we have inflation. One, uh, during COVID, it became more difficult to produce things. So the amount of stuff shrunk. Uh, Two, the war in the Ukraine. Uh, Three, there are all sorts of issues with, with climate change and bad crops. And four, on the other side of the the coin, there was a fair amount of money given out as assistance during COVID. So the amount of spending increased faster than the amount of stuff. So the goal is to bring those two more in line. COVID's, whether it's going away or not, the fact is it's having less of an impact on our ability to produce things than it used to. So the amount of goods and services seems to be growing and those kinds of problems are being addressed. And what the Fed is doing by raising interest rates is discouraging people from spending. It's reducing the amount of money floating around in the economy. If it's going to cost, if you want to do build an addition onto your home and it's you're going to have to take a loan at 2%, you're going to say, hey, that makes sense. At 6%, you're going to not make, you're going to be less likely to do it. If you're thinking of expanding a factory, at 2%, it makes sense. 6% doesn't make sense. So by raising interest rates, they hope to slow spending and therefore bring a better alignment between spending and stuff. And that's what they do when they raise interest rates. How long does that process normally take where you find like that equilibrium between spending and more stuff available? You know, there's no normal in economics. It's like A lot of people think, and this goes back to where people just can't rely on economists, that you plug everything into a formula, boom, out comes your answer. 
economics is a social science. It's like psychology. Could you imagine going to a psychologist who said, oh, I have my formula here. Just answer these data points and I'll have your, your hey, solution right here. it would right be here. nice. It, does, it just doesn't work that way. Biology works that way. Physics works that way. Psychology and economics don't work that way. So how long does it take to discourage people from spending when you raise interest rates? It takes a while. There's anyone who tells you that there's a, a it's six months, two weeks and five days, they're just making it up. And it's very interesting to me how, how many people make things up in economics. John Maynard Keynes, one of the most famous economists of all time, said economists make predictions not because they can, but simply because they're asked. So people feel like I'm going to be on a show. I have to say something. You're not going to get that. I have a plenty of other things to say. But I think a lot of economists feel like, oh, well, inflation is going to drop in six months. They don't know. There's a lot to talk about, but that's that's something that really is is just speculation. I think that's what can be the challenging part for us is just like normal humans out there walking around, like trying to live our lives is nobody really knows what's going to happen or how are things going to change. So how do we then, how do we then plan our, our money or, you know, um, be good with our money if we have no idea what's going to happen? Is it, is it just something where we almost kind of drown out all the noise and we just go back to like the, the money foundations and principles? Well, there are two sides to this. There's the individual and then there's the society and people could do what's best for them. They could save prudently for their retirement. They could invest wisely. That's what they could do on an individual level. But on a society level, they need to support policies and politicians who are going to promote policies that help the average person. I'll give you an example. When the economy is in the doldrums, a lot of people advocate for tax cuts for the wealthy. Think it through. This is not something where you need formal economic training. What exactly is that going to do? But think of the alternative tax cuts for middle and lower income people. What are middle income and lower in income people going to do with the money they get in a tax cut? They're going to go out and spend it. And what happens when people spend money? Businesses hire people. Businesses expand and the economy gets better. What happens when someone who's rich gets a tax cut? They park it in their savings or investment portfolio. It doesn't get respent right away into the economy. It doesn't create new jobs. It doesn't create new businesses. So that's something that just by using common sense, and this is a big point I make in the book, you have to look at the world carefully and you can figure most of this out. So that's an example of what people can do, they could support, they could look at this closely and support policies that are, are likely to make the world a better place, the economy better and better for the, for the average person. And I know we talked a moment ago about tax rates. There's no reason why taxes on investment income should be lower than taxes on work income. And I know the answer that some people give is, well, if you raise taxes on investment income, you discourage investment. But there's a retort to that. Well, if you raise taxes on work income, you discourage work. So people need to look at this and use their own common sense. And here's an important point and not be intimidated. Oh, that's a really important point because yeah, I think there, that's, you know, it, it, the, all of this, we money is already this taboo topic. We don't like to mm -hmm. talk about, we don't like to think about it. And so it already creates this distance between um you know, between what we what we think we can do to impact change and what we actually do. I think most of us just kind of stay locked in a, a place of fear or shame or guilt or regret or whatever it is around money and the money decisions we've made. So, you know, I love this this advice to just, you know, kind of go out there and and really understand these things and do something about it. I was, saw these interviews with pollsters, and they said people were, were more willing to talk about their sex lives than their financial lives. I'm sure you're aware of that, which I found very interesting. Yes, it's one of the reasons we named this show Everyone's Talking Money. So, <laughs> you know, let, let's let's have these conversations. Well, you're you're a professor at New York University. I already yes. know I want to I want to take your class. I think everybody should take your class. If <laughs> I had you as my econ teacher, I probably would have learned a lot more than I did. Uh, you know, how did you approach the topics that you wanted to have in this book? Because I would imagine you could have had like you know 
a 10,000 page book when we're, we're talking about economics. So how did you figure out what you, what you actually really wanted people to know and understand? Oh, that's a, thank you for that question. The, I wanted to give them an overview of the big picture of what I considered the important things. You could so easily get lost in the details in, in this, exactly how the Fed changes interest rates. You could spend, there are courses on that. This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about, cryptocurrencies. I can't tell you how many people have said, oh, it's too complicated. It's too complicated. Well, how the printer gets the ink on a $20 bill is also complicated. But what does that have to do with understanding money? Nothing. I mean, nothing. <laughs> they, they don't have to understand how the computers work, how the algorithms work. All they need to know, it's some string of data in cyberspace that they're paying for how that string of data works. And I think that's what intimidates people. They don't need to, uh, to understand every single thing, just like your listeners don't understand how they cut the paper for the currency, how they get the, the security strip in there. It may be interesting to some, but it's totally irrelevant if you want to understand what money is about. And it's the same thing with cryptocurrency. And it's the same thing with so many things in the economy. So what I try to do is I try to keep it as simple as possible. And I tried to give an overview on all of the, the major topics. As you know, I, I, I used to teach courses in macroeconomics in particular. And so I tried to cover all the major bases and keep it as, as simple as possible. Okay. So we've talked about the Fed. We've talked about the debt ceiling. We've talked about the economic inequality. Um, what else, And we've talked about how money is, is made, how it just mm -hmm. kind of poofs out there and the value mm -hmm. that it has. What are, you know, as we as we close out here, what are some of the other kind of key things around economics that we really need to understand? I think it's important for people to to look at the world carefully and to to see, for instance, we talked about tax rates. The tax system, a lot of people assume it's it's progressive. And if you look at it closely, uh, for instance, there are a few billionaires, and I mentioned them in the book, I can't recall them off the top of my head, who literally paid zero in taxes. And so a lot of people are in favor of raising taxes, but it's that's just not that simple. Because, for instance, in the book, I talk about how if a city or a state raises taxes, people just change their jurisdiction. And the richer they are, the easier that is. In fact, Donald Trump, during his presidency, relocated to, to Florida. When you say relocated, it didn't involve any physical movement. It just involved filing a form, which was called a change of domicile form. And poof, New York State lost every penny of, of income tax. I'm assuming there was some, if there was some. Whatever income tax he was paying to New York <laughs> State just disappeared. He moved to Florida where there was no income tax. So people need to pay attention to, to what's going on in, in the tax system. Um, it with, with regard to inheritance taxes... People can in inherit money completely tax-free. This is money that they did work for. And I think, again, they have to drown out the noise. For instance, there's always talk about the death tax. Well, there's a certain amount of money needed to finance the government, and the people come in only two flavors, dead and alive. So the extent that you reduce the taxes on the dead, you're increasing taxes on the living. You're essentially saying when you argue against the death tax, raise my taxes because there's X number of dollars that have to be raised. And if you're not going to raise it from wealthy people who died, and remember the, the estate tax exemption is $22 million. You're talking, that's the exemption. If you die with $22 million, your tax rate is zero. So you're essentially saying people with more than $22 million should pay nothing so that I, who presumably don't have $22 million, should pay more. People need to, to get involved with these issues and, and to assert their values because it's ultimately what comes down to values, how we divide up society's wealth. Clearly, we can't have everyone earning the same thing. That doesn't work. It's been tried. It's a colossal failure. But the other extreme doesn't work either. So we have to reach a balance. And if again, if we cede these decisions to a few people we view as technocrats, they may not come up with the answers you and I would like. So that's my most emphatic call to people to try to get involved these, in these issues. I know I'm, this is a self-serving request. Read the book and, and think about them and be more involved.
I think we need to get Howard back on the show. What do you think? I just love how he makes learning about economics just so fun, so easy, so understandable. But I really loved what he said as we wrapped up the interview. I just wanted to leave you with one other thing I thought about. I, don't, I went to high school in, in New York City, and we were required to take trigonometry, but we were not required to take economics. Now, I have a healthy respect for math. I was a math major in college, but come on, trigonometry and not economics? People don't know where money comes from, what the Fed does, and yet we're learning the angles of a triangle. I don't even remember what we learned in trigonometry, but the point you get my point. My point is that this aversion, this uh, disdain for, for talking about these things, for studying these things, for educating children about these things has to come to an end if we're going to make a better economy and a better society. I totally agree, Howard. If you want to connect with Howard, you can head to his website, howardyaris.com. You can also pick up a copy of his book, Understandable Economics, Everywhere Books Are Sold. So you know the drill. Share this episode with everybody you know, because we all need to know a little bit more about the economy and how it impacts our money. As always, you can head to those show notes for all the links to our episode sponsor, as well as our guests. I'll see you back here in a few days for a brand new episode. Everyone knows that putting money aside in savings is really important. But then what? Should you keep your savings locked in a CD for a higher rate or keep them liquid in a money market? Can your checking account help you save too? Or is it about creating the right combination? We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about the savings options that are right for you. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com. Member FDIC. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC.